bestbookbits.com brings you the book summary of Unscripted, Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Entrepreneurship by MJ DeMarco. What if life wasn't about decades of wage slavery, pain bills and then dying? Today's contemporary slavery is an implied social contract, whereas a gilded cage is exchanged for voluntary indebtedness and a lifelong toil. A price sacrificed by a non-refundable 50 years of Monday through Friday, a willful servitude in which freedom is only promised by the dawn of life's fading twilight. Has an invisible script hijacked your life? Unlock your truth, unleash your dream. Tired of sleepwalking through a mediocre life, bribed by mindless video games, repetitive weekends, and a scant paycheck from a soul-suffocating job? Welcome to the Scripted Club, where membership is neither perceived or consented. The fact is, ever since you've been old enough to sit obediently in a classroom, you have been culturally engineered for servitude, unwittingly enslaved into a Machiavellian system where illusionary rules go unchallenged, sanctified traditions go unquestioned, and lifelong dreams go unfulfilled. As a result, your life is hijacked and marginalized into debt, despair, and dependence. Life's death sentence becomes the daily curse of the trivial and mundane. Fun fades, dreams die. Don't let life's consolidation price become a car and a weekend. Recapture what is yours and make a revolutionary repossession of life and liberty through the pursuit of entrepreneurship. A paradigm shift isn't needed. The damn paradigm needs to be thrown out altogether. The truth is, if you blindly follow conventional wisdom pushed by conventional people living conventional lives, you can expect to be anything but conventional. Rewrite life's script, ditch the job, give Wall Street the bird, and escape the insanity of trading your life away for a paycheck and an elderly promise called retirement. Unscript yourself today and start leading life instead of life leading you. Now, this is going to be a long summary, so uh, tune in and prepare to get your mind blown. Introduction. If you don't know, let me break it to you. Slavery still exists, except today's contemporary slavery is called the script. An implied social contract, whereas a gilded cage is exchanged for voluntary indebtedness and a lifelong toil, a price sacrificed by a non-redeemable 50 years of Monday through Friday. An invisible servitude in which freedom is only promised by the arrival of life's fading twilight. Unscripted is your blueprint into an awakening of abundance, freedom, and happiness. A keystone to unleashing a life few dream of. Conventional wisdom, the road to a conventional life. The rich get richer because the rich aren't bound by the script. They're the ones profiting from it. A compromise party is someone who holds the script as their life's operating system. Compromise parties can be friends, family, co-workers, and authority figures, teachers, coaches, and guidance counselors. As such, script propagation is parroted. The compromise party was taught X, Y, and Z as a youngster, and now as an adult, they will convey the same beliefs because it's the only reality they know. The 9 to 5, paycheck to paycheck, live for a weekend is their life, and it shall become yours. When it comes to script, speak from the scripted, ask yourself this. If I accept average advice from average people living average lives, can I expect to be anything but average? Like a compromised party, a prejudiced party also disseminates scripted doctrine. However, whereas a compromised party parrots platitudes simply because they think it's best for you, a prejudiced party profits from script speak. The scripted operating system, the web of servitude. The scripted operating system goes like this, two doors, one slaughterhouse. As you can see from the image up the top, you have the cedars, which is friends and family, financial, education, government, corporate, and media. Going below that, you have the hyper-realities, name days, corporations, money, freedom, consumerism, virtual reality, entertainment, college degrees, and hyper-reality. Below that, the life paths, which is temporal prostitution. And then below that, you have door one and door two, 
the sidewalk and the slow lane, all going down to distraction, down to model citizen, which we'll get into soon. The scripted OS. Here is the scripted OS, the Cedars. Like a torrent hosted within a computer system, Cedars write and enforce scripted doctrine. As described earlier, Cedars are compromised or prejudiced parties. The hyper-realities. The script's illusions. The hyper-realities reinforce your obedience and captivity through deception, distortion, or diversion. Temporal prostitution. Cedars and their hyper-realities sanctify a criminal trade for your most precious asset, your time. The life paths. The illusion of free choice and deciding your slave owner. Door A, the sidewalk, or door B, the slow lane. Both lead to the slaughterhouse. Neither makes you the boss of you. Distraction. If you're distracted, the scripted OS stays hidden. Model citizenship becomes a foregone conclusion. Model citizenship. What is it? You unwillingly become a scripted servant who is M. Mediocre. O. Obedient. D. Dependent. E. Entertained. And L. Lifeless. And who then becomes a cedar a compromised party propagating the scripted OS. The Cedars. Our life sucks. Yours should too. The Six Cedars. Friends and family, education, corporate, financial, government, media. Number one. Friends and family. Our life sucks. So yours should too. If the people in your family or peer group are not happy and living a life you would like to lead, and their life advice should be considered cautiously. Number two, education. Get in line, raise your hand, follow instructions. Educational institutions and their scripted tentacles are now manufacturing entire generations of brain-dead adults who never failed in their entire life and have a wall of participation trophies to show for it. Their greatest accomplishments are character chores in their virtual versus the real world. Their brain wants to believe that life is fair and it will protect your feelings. Number three, corporate cedars. Be all you can be. Aim straight at our kids. The scripted message is clear. Adult success is correlated to buying shit. Flash your credit card, finance your rock star life, and show up styling. Do so, and happily ever after is your reward. Number four, the financial cedar. Trust those who cannot be trusted. The goal is your underlying belief that your life savings are in good hands. When you find out it isn't, you're too late, you're too old, or worse, dead. Number five, government. The Santa Claus for adults who live like children. The Santa Claus for adults who live like children. When you participate in a scripted economy, paying a fortune for a college degree, financing a 30-year mortgage, buying a bunch of crap you don't need, you bankroll government. Number six, media. We're objective in our subjectivity. As in the movies, Matrix, your scripted life is an integral to the machine's survival. By chasing the next greatest gadget and the next greatest weekend high, you intravenously tap yourself into the belly of the beast. Yes, the rat race needs rats. The slaughterhouse needs lambs. Question is, are you willing to sell your soul for a weekend and television? Hyperreality, your illusionary captors, the hyperreality. Name days, corporations, money, freedom, consumerism, virtual reality, entertainment, college degrees, hyperreality. Because your brain deficiently perceives reality, what follows is a great cascade of false conclusions causing misguided beliefs. Misguided beliefs cause misguided actions. Misguided actions produce unwanted results, and unwanted results create dissatisfaction. Hyperreality number one, named days. Named days order the week by titles, Monday through Sunday, carrying with it the implication that Monday starts work and Friday ends it, while the weekend reserves play. The fact is, named days are a hyperreality, one of the industrialized world has perfected to perfection. Beneath the name day scheme is a man-made illusion your mind has made real. The illusion that your life's limited and precious time must be systematically segregated by days, with each day's title, 
designating whether work or play is expected. Hyperreality number two, consumerism. Consumerism is the myth that consumption can produce success or happiness. Despite that Vogue magazine, despite that Audi commercial, despite that banner ad, you are not what you own, but you can be owned by what you own. Hyperreality number three, a college degree. The college degree hyperreality is two-pronged. First, it is the stale idea that intelligence and financial wealth require a college degree, regardless of cost and more so, a life without one is forever underscored by underemployment and underachievement. Hyperreality number four, hyperpersonality. Hyperpersonality is a person's public image, a facade projected by fame or social media, a carefully crafted mirage that does not represent the real, humanized version of the individual. Hyperreality number five, virtual reality. Virtual reality is a captivating and addictive stimulation of an alternative reality exploiting a series of enticement heuristics, competition, goal achievement, faux improvement, and positive feedback loops. Virtual reality, or VR, much like its sibling hyperpersonality, plays on our desires to feel worthy and respected, while doing so with comfort and ease, void of risk and public humiliation. Hyperreality number six, entertainment. The entertainment hyperreality is an emotional or intellectually irrational investment in an entertainment format. Sports, television, movies, where the investment becomes either an impassionate part of your identity or an erroneous belief about your reality. Hyperreality number seven, money. Money, the world's dominant hyperreality, is a mutually shared belief that physical money, a stack of paper bills, or virtual digital money, a number on a computer screen, is valuable, and that the person possessing it is equally valuable. Hyperreality number eight is freedom. The most fundamental hyperreality running rampant in the first world is freedom itself. The perception that we come into the world free and unencumbered, a sovereign person born with inalienable rights that cannot be co-opted, confiscated, or subjected by any laws, customs, or beliefs. Not true. Not for you, me, or anyone else. Hyperreality number nine, cooperations. Underneath the corporate vial, cranking the gears ain't monkeys, robots, or artificial intelligence, but people. Managers, employees, corporate executives, and shareholders. And these people are capable of every sin imaginable. Corporations are evil and greedy, No, people are evil and greedy. Temporal prostitution, trading good time for bad. Temporal prostitution, the subordination of time to money. The presumption that time is unlimited and can be fecklessly traded, squandered and dishonored, while money is pilelessly converted as a limited resource. Free time today is better than free time tomorrow. Youthful time sold today, working five days a week, so you can buy elderly time later. Retirement in your twilight is a bad bet. Under temporal prostitution, the things you buy cost more than just money. They cost future fragments of your life, transforming free time into indentured time. Free time is the time you own. It's the only time that's important. No one has a claim on it. You do what you want. Sleep in. Write, read, whatever warms your heart. Conversely, indentured time is time someone else owns. School, studying, work, traffic, your biz, etc. The life paths. Two doors, one slaughterhouse, no difference. You have the life paths. Temporal prostitution, either door number one, sidewalk, or door number two, slow lane. Door number one, the sidewalk. Trade tomorrow for today. The path is the sidewalk. The promise, happiness through consumption. The leash, consumption and entitlement. The collar, debt and dependence. The slave master, corporations and or government. And the rat race, consume, debt, work or vote, repeat. Door number two, the slow lane. Trade today for tomorrow. The path 
the slow lane. The promise, freedom later through investing. The leash, deprivation. The slave master, time and Wall Street. The collar, hope. And the rat race, save, work, invest, wait, repeat. While the sidewalker is leashed and collared by consumption and debt, the slow laner is leashed and collared by deprivation and hope. I call it hope, stop, and wait plan. Hope I have a job, not just a job, but a good job. Hope the economy gives me that good job for the next 50 years. Hope the stock market yields 10% a year and doesn't crash. Hope the housing market doesn't implode and erase my equity. Hope I'm alive by retirement. Hope I'm healthy. Hope the government doesn't hyperinflate my savings or the currency in which it is denominated. Hope the government can continually fund a bankrupt social security program. The script wants you to hope, stop, and wait, because the time you discover winning at this crap is like snake size at the craps table. It's too late. Many who struggle financially have a strong work ethic. The problem is their hard work is being channeled into an ineffective and outdated system. Distraction, the Ministry of Entertainment. The scripted OS. You see, if you're too plumply entertained in a hyper-realistic distraction, you're no threat. No threat to the paradigm and certainly no threat to the meat grinder awaiting. Just sit back, relax and focus on your movie because this train is leaving. Model Citizenry, serial number 666-778888. Model Citizenry. As the script's newest manufactured model citizen, life is mediocre. Life has regressed into an unremarkable yet comfortable ordinariness where thriving is not an objective, but surviving. O is for obedient. Free thinking is dead. You follow popular opinion and trust your government and the news organizations fanning the flames of your biases. D. Dependent. You're a debt surf owned by an army of corporations, product and service producers, Wall Street, government, or worse, you are owned by time. E. Entertained. Your entertained and humid mind distracts the heart to the point where your soul is no longer heard. Lifeless. L. Dead at 25, but not buried until 75. Goals, non-existent. Optimism, scant. Dreams, murdered. Living unscripted. Script has an escape through unscription. A life-changing subset of thought and action underwritten by entrepreneurship. As fuck you implies, unscripted is about pure, unadulterated life and liberty. Life means owning your time and thoughts while curating your existence. It is not just to be, but to become. The fuck you of liberty has five primary freedoms. They are, number one, freedom from work. Number two, freedom from scarcity and fiscal constraint. Number three, freedom from hyper-realistic influence. Number four, freedom from hope and dependence. Five, freedom from ordinary Fuck this before fuck you. This fuck this event is a traumatic moment, epiphanic and painful. It's a pejorative mental breakdown, one that sounds like any of the following. No more, I've had it. Or I can't live like this. This fuck this event smacks you when the pain of the status quo finally exceeds the anticipated pain of its escape. The point of no return where nothing else matters. Fuck this event's are memorable and often unmistakable. If you are unsure of yours, more than likely you have not had one. You see, most people are interested in entrepreneurship, financial freedom and success, but most never commit. Why? It just doesn't hurt bad enough. There's only one way to tell the difference between a fake fuck this event and a real fuck this event. A fake fuck this event has four threats and any one of them will send you right back to the script. Our real fuck you event has no threats. To breathe or not to breathe isn't a conscious choice. It just happens. Threat number one, mediocre comfort. A real fuck this event doesn't care about mediocre comfort. Give a man an okay job that pays just enough to provide mediocre comfort and I'll show you a man that will keep his job indefinitely. 
This is by design. Threat number two, your guarded pride and ego. If you're not willing to take a minimum wage job, you're not willing to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs can go weeks, sometimes months, without getting paid. Are you willing to make that sacrifice? If you aren't willing to work for the minimum, how can you expect to work for nothing? Threat number three, I have responsibility. Responsibility necessitates consumption. Stack extemporaneous responsibility into life and consumption is mandated and the script loves consumption. Threat number four, fear. A real fuck this event fears nothing. And if Piffinick fuck this event understands that the world doesn't end when you lose your job. The unscripted entrepreneurial framework, Tune EF. The micro and macro processor scaffold the framework and grease the entrepreneurial G-spot, unscripted's birthplace. The first sub-process is your micro process. Your micro processes are the thought patterns, your beliefs, biases, and your ability to self-reflect. It's how you think, feel, and interpret the world around you. The framework's second sub-process is a macro process. Macro processes are repeated and modified actions. The words repeated and modified are critical to results. Changing the action from an event, a solitary action changing nothing to a process, an action chain that changes everything. Successful micro macro process. Looking at the image you can see micro process then heaps of macro process on the way to the event which is the goal. One self-imposed prison Beliefs, biases, and bullshit, 3B. The unscripted entrepreneurial framework, beliefs, biases, and bullshit. 3B, beliefs. What you think is true, that necessarily isn't. Biases, your mental shortcuts and default assumptions after reaffirming or protecting your beliefs. Bullshit, your internalized narrative about why things are, or simply the bullshit you sell yourself. Belief number one, the shortcut scam. Ordinary doesn't compel extraordinary. The shortcut scam is the idea that extraordinary results can be achieved by uncovering a secret bypass or a miracle weapon, and such can skirt the real hard work that actually creates the extraordinary results. The process principle is an intelligent awareness that extraordinary results require an extraordinary effort consisting of daily habits, routines, and sacrifices. Here are the nine steps to help you moving toward the process side of the event slash process dichotomy. Number one, intelligent awareness to neurological defaults. Number two, modify expectations and realign the source of difficulty. Three, identify and visualize the chance target. Four, apply mathematics to the goal. Five, identify the daily action target. Six, identify threats to the daily target. Seven, identify the proper battlefields. Eight, attack bad habits with inconvenience and or pain. And number nine, act until echo. Believe two, the special scam. I'm not good at that. The special scam is a double-edged belief that our innate talents are enough to accomplish our dreams or that our innate talents are immovable Fixed characteristics immune from improvement. Underneath the special scam lies the greatest destructive force to our dreams, a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is the belief that talent alone causes success and that your basic qualities of intelligence, athleticism, and even rhythm are fixed traits that cannot be changed or improved. Ha, huh, yes, rhythm. New skills can be acquired and mastered regardless of your current level of talent or intelligence. Belief number three, the consumption scam. How much time did that cost? Debt mandates the necessity of future work, even if you cannot find work. Consumerism has no balanced middle. You're either a consumer or a producer. Or worse, you deny the paradigm altogether. Belief number four, the money scam. I can get rich by wanting to get rich. Most people are broke and remain broke because the money scam has made them perpetual chases of something that cannot be chased. It can only be attracted by offering perceived value. Belief number five, the poverty scam. 
I'm poor because you're rich. Sorry, you're poor because you keep buying shit you shouldn't buy, including fantasies that don't exist. That truth is this. Everything great in society has happened because money moves massively due to massive value creation and delivery. And yes, this created rich people. Without wealth, you'd be transported back to the Dark Ages, where you'd sit in an outhouse, burn candles for light, and use pigeons to send letters to your nana in Archon. Great value precedes great wealth. If you want to make millions, impact millions, become a wonderful fiduciary to your fellow man, and you will stop being worthless. Belief number six, the luck scam. You don't play, you don't win. Luck bad or good, is just what you call the results of a human being consciously interacting with chance. And some people are better at interacting with chance than others. Unlike money, luck has no brain and holds no grudges or prejudices. It only reacts to the mathematical probabilities of an applied stimulus. Belief number seven, the frugality scam, live poor, die rich. Frugality scam, The belief that obsessive expense reduction, penny pinching, and experiential deprivation will someday pay off in the opposite, rich life experiences, freedom, and abundance. If you don't have a sizable income, it doesn't matter how cheap you are. You can't squeeze a dime from a nickel. Get rich quick might indeed exist, but don't mistake that for get rich easy. Years of disciplined, focused work channeled into the right business system can make it happen. Easy is not part of the equation. Belief number eight, the compound interest scam. Wall Street ain't making you rich. The compound interest scam is a serendipitous orthodoxy that the stock market will someday make you, the common man, uncommonly rich. Wheeled by time, reality, and inflation, the physical tri-cycle debunks compound interest and it's why it won't make you rich. Truth number one, time. Resign yourself to compound interest for wealth and you resign yourself to hope and time for freedom. Hope on my life after X decades, hope my money is worth something after X decades, and I hope that the markets yield X percent after X decades. Sorry, hope based on variable returns, variable market instruments, and variable life expectancy is a bad plan. Truth number two, reality. In the financial markets, an interest rate or a growth rate must be attributed to a financial instrument, such as a stock, bond, or an asset class. Interest or growth rates cannot exist without a corresponding instrument or asset class attached. This creates the rate, and each instrument carries risk, which means you could lose some or all of your money. Truth number three, inflation. The utopian charts cannot be trusted because trust is not in the calculation. Can you trust the government to be a good steward of taxpayer money? Can you trust physical policy makers to keep inflation from exploding? Can you trust a a growing economy for five decades? Answer these questions honestly and you'll realize inflation is a gamble and your bet is placed with people who historically have not been prudent. Failure is normally temporary and can be remedied by trying again. A compound interest failure is permanent because its attempt spans decades. Trying again is impossible. And in the end, Wall Street is not a place for growing wealth, but a place for asset speculation, earning income, and deploying capital. Yes, save early and often. However, don't think you can sail to the promised land on a compound interest wave. It's ineffective for creating wealth unless millions are amassed first. Then it's powerful, perhaps as powerful as Lustig's money printing machine. The biases, your brain's delusions. After you pursued unscripted using Tune F, there are seven primary brain battles you'll face. They are change adversity, while refusing change is refusing excellence. Your brain's quarterback in the authentic you versus your brain war is change adversity. Change adversity is your brain's prediction for comfort and status quo, despite being surrounded by change. Behind change adversity is what called a status quo bias, our brain's preference for predictability over instability. With change adversity as our brain's frontline defense, change adversity's threats are double-edged. Righteousness, why you'd rather be right than rich. 
Righteousness is not about being fair or just, but about our urgency to see and hear only things that support our biases, while discounting, ignoring, or arguing the rest. Antithetical apathy. Though suffocating shouldn't hate air. If financial freedom and and autonomy are your goals, your beliefs must align with those goals. If they don't, you'll either A, lie to yourself, or B, sabotage your effort causing tension and stress. Both make goals unattainable. Semmel washing unconventional compels conventional reactions. When traditional paradigms are opposed or questioned, not only is the message attacked, but so is the messenger. A similar washing is the friction we face when other people discover we aren't following the conventional scripted brainwash. Podium popping. When someone else's pen can't write your story. We're all perfectly imperfect, including our heroes. While doing X, Y, and Z might have worked for jobs, it might not work for you. Every one of us needs to stop hero-worshipping mortal beings and be our own heroes. Every one of us needs to stop hero-worshipping mortal beings and be our own heroes. Be a hero to your wife, to your family, and to your children. Stop trying to write your story with someone else's pen and instead start using your own. Survival Spotlighting Failures keep their mouths closed. Survival spotlighting. Failures keep their mouths closed. Survival spotlighting, which is similar to podium popping, is when you focus on survivors of some process because they've showcased while overlooking those who are not, usually due to lack of visibility, and hence, you come to an inaccurate conclusion. Momentum paralysis. Why you can't move despite movement. Momentum paralysis is not about immobility, but being unable to depart from your current course of action. It is our tendency to allow momentum, or flow, to carry us through life rather than making proactive decisions, which are decisively better for our future, even when those decisions have painful or uncomfortable attachments. Bullshit from bullshitters, crutches, cliches, and cults. The story exemplifies the next B, among the three Bs, bullshit. Bullshit 1.0 is crutches, the stinking pile of excuses and manufactured fairy tales we tell ourselves. These scapegoats justify do nothingness, other times they explain away failures or circumstances. And as long as we clutch these convenient fantasies, change adversity and righteousness bribe us into buying our victimhood. Bullshit 2.0 is cliches, a bunch of meaningless mantras and proverbs revered as gospel, pithy slogans, sweat and soothing, reassuring, and unfortunately, invitations for more do-nothingness. And Bullshit 3.0 is cults and their leaders, gurus and slithery figureheads who will fill your head with whatever you want it to be filled with. Money buys happiness when you let it buy you freedom. Money buys you happiness when you let it buy your freedom. The paradox of practice is the art of selling a strategy that the author doesn't really use or that isn't responsible for making him rich. Burying Bullshit. Three Bulldozers. Technique number one, Socratic Questioning. Socratic Questioning is a disciplined inquiry into trains of thought. By looking into the depths of these trains, biases, assumptions, and possible blocks of progress are uncovered. Technique number two. The Cancer Corollary. The Cancer Corollary is a hypothetical syllogism that exposes cerebral bullshit and eradicates it. Used willfully, it kills paper crutches and dart-boarded excuses. Anytime your cerebral dogma mouse off and argues you're too young, too old, too poor, to this and to that, the Cancer Corollary breaks the pattern. When someone has what you desperately want or need, their backstory becomes irrelevant. And this is irrelevant because it proves that race, education, divorce, marriage, ugliness, this, that, are all self-funded delusions. The fact is, when you have what others want, no one cares about your circumstances, your whys, your motives, your degree, your history, your anything. Technique number three, identity, cataclysms. Real change comes from identity and self, not from interim motivations jump-started by books or YouTube Binging. Basically, you have to be what you want to become first so the actions can follow. Basically, 
You have to be what you want to become first so the actions can follow. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Be, act on being, then have meaning and purpose, the unstoppable will to win. Meaning and purpose. Great results require a great commitment. Commitment fires the process principle where habit becomes lifestyle and lifestyle becomes winning results. Beware the wonder twins of epically bad life advice. When passion doesn't solve people's problems, passion doesn't pay bills. Notably, when the world kicks on your feedback loop and says, this is awesome, I like this, here's my cash, you too will love what you do. The feedback loop drives passion, which drives action, which drives results. See, it's easy to love what you do when others do too. Don't be passionate about what needs to be done. Be passionate about what you will become. Ignite your purpose. Invigorate your soul. If there's something obsessive in your life keeping you awake at night, congratulations, you're Skywalker. The force is strong in you. And therein lies the chasm between interest or commitment. Shallow desires don't compel sacrifice, whereas a committed purpose sacrifices everything. It borders obsession. Denying the control in your life denies your free-range freedom and blunts autonomy and happiness. You can always control what you do and how you think. You can always control what you do and how you think. How to create a business that changes your life. Fast lane entrepreneurship. Represented by the left circle and unionized with a strong meaning and purpose, compelled with rewritten beliefs. Fast lane entrepreneurship is encompassed within one governing principle. A productocracy, followed by five core commandments, frequently referred to as sense. The productocracy, how to print money and sleep well. Productocracy. A productocracy pulls money to the value creators, businesses who grow organically through peer recommendations and repeat customers, compelled by a distinguished product slash service not readily offered elsewhere. The evidence of heavy advertising signifies an increased probability that a productocracy, an incredible tell-your-friend company, is not evident. Few make buying decisions based on advertising. Instead, buying decisions are made through social media, personal recommendations, and peer reviews. Perceived value hustlers are interested in having the best marketing, the best copy, and the best sales funnels, not the best product. The commandment of control. Own what you build. Control. To ensure you're on top of the food chain, the commandment of control requires that your entire operation, from product development to marketing to distribution to other operational components, be within your sphere of influence or diversified from influence. Amazon is a perfect as well as dangerous illustration of how entrepreneurs hitchhike themselves into one-way trips with another business. Hitchhiking is when your business is symbiotically codependent with another vehicle owned and driven by someone else, and that someone cannot be trusted or controlled. Yeah, you're at the mercy of a corporate stranger, and he's driving, his decisions, and his motives. The control commandment is not about absolutism, but about risk mitigation and probability. You can violate control, defy the odds, and still succeed. Take, for example, a company like Facebook, Airbnb, Alibaba, and Uber. None of these companies really own anything, but instead, they control things. Facebook makes no content, but controls it. Airbnb owns no real estate. Uber owns no cars. Alibaba owns no inventory. They all control it. As you can see, control doesn't always equate to ownership. The commandment of entry Difficulty is the opportunity. Entry. The commandment of entry states, as entry barriers to any business or startup process weaken or become easterfied, so does the strength or the potential of opportunity. Simply put, the easier the opportunity, the worse it is. Conversely, the harder something is to solve, the greater the opportunity. Entrepreneurship is about problem solving, creating convenience, satisfying desires, and becoming valuable. If you're an entrepreneur scooping for ideas, the best are the hard ones because the difficulty represents the opportunity. 
When difficulty doesn't exist and the commandment of entry looms, another red flag is hoisted. You aren't solving any problems. The magnitude of the problem solved is the magnitude of money you can make. The commandment of need, how to engineer opportunity in any industry. Need. Whenever you say, I can't find ideas, what you're really saying is, the world is perfect and it needs nothing. The commandment of need states if you own a controlled and entry-barred enterprise that provides relative value, satisfying needs or wants, you will win growth, profits, and possibly passive income for life. To dominate markets and win sales, engineer a value skew. It starts by identifying the value array and its attributes. Here's how. First, examine both your product and its industry with the goal to identify every value attribute, no matter how seemingly insignificant. Remember, you don't know what's important to your customer, so brainstorming everyone is the best practice. The second attribute group is its secondary attributes, which consist of the product's marketing and delivery to the customer. This would be your website's design, order processing, photos, company story, customer service, shipping, refund policy, telephone, or lack thereof, sales copy, reviews, social media posts, anything that could make or break a sale is an attribute. Whenever you can skew value within a product's pool of attributes, you stand out and cast a bigger market tent. The bigger the skew, the more attractive your company becomes to the consumer. Value skew. The six misappropriations miss. Number one, the market myth. This is where the business owner ignores the market and doesn't see relative value as a success metric. Number two, the isolation myth. is the figurative equivalent of going to a gunfight with one bullet in the barrel. Evaluating value and opportunity contingent on one sliding variable, price. Number three, the blockbuster myth. This is where you errantly isolate the value metric based solely on your ability to craft a unique product never before seen. Number four, the crowded room myth. Reasons that your idea is no good because someone is already doing it. The market is too crowded and there isn't room for you. Number five, the empty room myth. Once the entrepreneur discovers the room is empty, the idea is devalued based on the rationale. Oh, there isn't a market for it or there mustn't be any money in this industry. Number six, the use myth. Yes, you must believe in your product and its superiority. You must be a fan of its value to the world, but you yourself. The use myth holds that only other people need to find it valuable. You do not. Finding fast lane ideas, 13 ways. Finding fast lane ideas and creating value come from one or two sources. Number one, innovation. You blaze your own path and do something never done before. Number two, improvement. You tread an existing path and do something being done already, but do it better by skewing value attributes. Number one is language. Pay attention to what you hate. No matter how nuanced or stupid it might sound, what do you wish was easier, more convenient, less painful? Number two, inconvenience. Anything inconvenient is an opportunity. The inconvenience can be the product itself or the process surrounding the product. Number three, simplification and or easification. Anything complicated which needs simplification is an opportunity. Number four, wants. A want is something desired but not necessarily needed. Utility and functionality are secondary. Want opportunities are plentiful because demand can be influenced by marketing. Number five, service gaps. Crappy customer service is an opportunity. Six, geographical arbitrage or changing the pond is taking something common in your area and repositioning it to an area where there is an inadequate supply. Crowd feeding entry violations. The best opportunity rarely comes from joining the crowd, but serving it. Number eight, value arbitrage. The mechanism behind value arbitrage is simply adding value. Nine, repurposing, is taking various raw materials and reusing them for some other purpose not easily recognized. Number 10, marketing arbitrage. The truth is the world is full of shitty marketers, bad salesmen, and poor communicators. You can create the greatest product on the planet 
and no one will know about it with poor marketing. If you can't persuade or motivate someone to buy and try, you'll fail. Number 11, overcapitalization is when any business organization abandons its original value creating mission and instead prioritizes profit. So much so that it's disgustingly obvious. Number 12, stakeholder demotions. Stakeholder demotion usually begins once a company receives outside funding as customer satisfaction becomes secondary to investor satisfaction, ROI. And 13, improvements counterpart is removement. Removement is when your product removes or subtracts something, becoming differentiated. It is addition by subtraction, whereas the subtraction is the removal of something while the addition happens within your value skew. The fact is, most new businesses spawn from the founder's domain experience. Domain experience is any activity or industry you are intimately familiar with. Unfortunately, many aspiring entrepreneurs remain aspiring for one simple fact. They refuse to acquire domain experience, namely job experience, and in doing so they isolate themselves from opportunity. If you're not getting out of the house and encountering life, you won't encounter life's problems. Opportunities don't ring doorbells, and it certainly doesn't wait for someday. This practice asking for an audience about their problems is called solution selling. The commandment of time. Earn more than money. Earn time. Time. The commandment of time has two components. The first is physicality, where your value must exist in a space-time separate from you. This book exists regardless of my existence. On the other hand, if you consult for a living, your income stops when you stop. There is no physicality. The second is detachment. Eventually, in your enterprise's evolution, you must detach from its physicality, effectively freeing your time and life. When this is accomplished, it puts you on the clock 24-7, giving you the ability to earn perpetually through time versus in time. This is how you wake up and earn a day's wage before brewing the morning coffee. The big irony of passive income is it's anything but passive. Every single entrepreneur I know enjoys passive income today exercised an extraordinary and committed process yesterday. To honor the commandment of time, simply forget about it. Yeah, forget about it, but only in the short term. Instead, focus on legacy value systems, LVS, for long term. There are six legacy value systems, each capable of passive income. Some are more autonomous and hands-off, while others require more babysitting, sometimes for years, in order of legacy strength, they are number one, money systems, two, digital product systems, three, software slash internet systems, four, rental systems, five, human resource systems, and six, product systems. Your objective in creating legacy value through a business system is an intermediate payment of money, but an eventual payment of free time. The commandment of scale win life and liberty not dinner and a movie. Scale. Scale instructs that legacy value systems must be replicated through mass or magnitude while making a profitable impact. The four definitive components are, number one, legacy value system, two, replication, three, mass or magnitude, and four, profitable impact. Expected value is expected outcome of many occurrences. For expected value to work, you need occurrences. In entrepreneurship, we call occurrences failure. The more lives you impact in either scale or magnitude, the more money you will make. In other words, impact millions to make millions. If there was ever a secret to wealth, both monetarily and spiritually, impact millions are the only two words needed. There are three basic scale strategies, each with their own internal challenges. They are, number one, the customer strategy. Number two, a unit strategy is a local business iterated in multiple markets through replication, chains, network marketing, or franchising. Three, channel strategy. Instead of selling directly to the consumer, a customer strategy, your product is sold to a channel or a distribution center. With a channel strategy, your challenge isn't selling to your end user, but selling wholesale 
to the decision makers of the channel. Kinetic execution. Everything significant started insignificantly. Kinetic execution. Kinetic execution is meaningful action before answers, a method of situational and incremental problem solving graduated to resolve a larger problem, which culminates into your business solution. Components. Kinetic execution's first component is represented by the outermost circle, the market mind, and understanding that the market cannot be forecast, predicted, or tamed. As an entrepreneur, the best we can do with the market mind is engage it. Whenever you interact with the market, two types of reactions are inevitable. Number one, the most common, diffusion, and two, the desired, echoes. Diffusion is when the market absorbs or ignores your message slash value proposition and chooses to do nothing. Despite this, it's still a reaction. A market echo is direct feedback, a reflective, unbiased, and uncensored representation of the market mind. Saturating the market with your action is great, but you've got to tune your senses and unwrap the gifts of echoes. Inside, you'll find clues to where you should and should not be heading. Action and assessment are worthless without adjustment. The entire point of grinding the first two, as, is to uncover how to react. The seven P's of process go from idea to productocracy. Kinetic execution's final sequence is represented by the innermost circle and the customer life cycle, the seven P's of process. The seven P's are where shit gets done. Number one, plan, but don't go crazy. The kinetic execution planning phase is relatively short and confirms the strength of your opportunity by a sense evaluation. 2. Control. Does your solution have any primary dependence for execution? If so, what control risks can be mitigated? Does your solution have secondary dependence? Partners, suppliers, manufacturing, importers, channels. Number 3. Entry. What are the entry barriers for your solution? What key resources, assets, or relationships strengthen and can strengthen your entry walls? Does your solution require substantial resource inputs and or coordination for execution? Is the concept to launch two days or two months? How will your competitors respond to your solution? And can you sustain their adjustment? Number four is need. Have you identified all the value attributes within your industry? Is your proposed SKU strong enough to adequately firm a unique selling proposition, a USB, relevant to your target customer? Can you effectively communicate this value SKU to your target customer? How is your solution monetized? What are the primary and secondary revenue models? Number five is time. What resources, if any, are needed to dissolve your solution from your time? What dependencies are needed to dissolve your solution from your time? What are the future challenges for these requirements? 6. Scale. Are these existing mediums, channels, or partners that can reach large numbers of your target market? What is your solution's scaling economy and their resources? Funding, infrastructure, and human capital required to scale it. Are there any scale challenges in the cost structure and or supply chain? After your concept survives the sense ringer, It's time to prove its worth. Nothing sucks more than spending months and thousands of dollars only to discover the market doesn't want your product. Soft proof's objective is to verify your concept slash idea with the market mind before spending a fortune in resources. In entrepreneurial circles, the soft proof is often referred to as validation. You can soft proof your concept either indirectly or directly using six different methods. Number one, language patterns, two, channel research, three, search volume, four, ask slash interview the market, and five, market simulation. Captured email addresses are circumstantial soft proof, cash is a verdict, and hard proof. Once your idea is soft proven, you're ready to draft your process path. The key for an effective process path is to define the major action blocks and their requirements while eliminating unnecessary actions and their cost. After outlining the process path and confirming soft proof, you probably need a functional prototype. For digital services, this is your beta version. Your objective is the prototype stage isn't a feature-rich masterpiece, 
but something simplistic yet valuable and economically demandable to the marketplace. In the end, it must do what you claim. The prototype stage is the valley within the desert of desertion, where entrepreneurs are clubbed with shiny object syndrome. Every idea seems better and easier than the one they're working on, with no feedback loop, zero sales, emails, or market resonance. For months, the motivation cycle stalls and the passion can quit us. This is normal. Expect a long and lonely walk. Mud through it and let the market mind light the way. The next three stages with the kinetic execution model all occurred within the customer life cycle, a transitional process where strangers are turned into prospects, prospects into customers, and customers into disciples. The life cycle has seven steps. Number one, awareness, exposing your product to the target customer. Example, your target customer sees your product's ad in their Facebook newsfeed. Number two, evaluation, providing your customer with enough information to make a decision. A website visit, a white paper, FAQs, and internet search. Example, your target customer visits your website and reviews your offer. Number three, onboarding. Converting strangers into prospects by securing them in your marketing ecosystem. Example, your target customer provides an email address or signs up for a free trial. Number four, purchase. Converting from a prospect to a customer. Example, your customer converts from a free trial to a paid premium or buys your product after being emailed free content. Number five, use. Management and monitoring how customers use your product. Example, most of your target customers renew or reorder your product. Others ask for a variation of it that you do not have. Number six, engagement. Interaction and relationship building with your customer to foster retention and or repurchase. Example, you send your customer a periodic email regarding trends or topics within your industry. Number seven, discipleship creating loyal customers who become evangelists for your company, hence fulfilling the productocracy prophecy. Example, your target customer shares and recommends your product on social media and in person. Only act, assess, and adjust, followed by these three checkpoints, can flag a failure worthy of, okay, this didn't work, next idea. Number one, checklist your channel. Are you sure you're leveraging the right channel with the right targeting measures? Or is there a better medium to reach your audience? Number two, checklist your reach. Check the sample size and ensure it's large enough to warrant conclusions about its data. I recommend at least 10,000 impressions or 1,000 clicks. Number three, checklist your message. I'd estimate most launch failures are from failed offers, not from failed products. The final P of kinetic execution is the money stage, propagation. This is where millionaires and billionaires are created. It's wild growth, scale, and exposing your productocracy to the masses. Regardless of industry, propagating a productocracy is accomplished by reach expansion, channel expansion, and or network expansion. Preservation of cash and its ultimate redirection into growth is the only thing that matters. Make execution matter. Make execution matter. Here are 13 best practices. Number one, expect difficulty and deviation. Number two, be faithfully monogamous. Three, balance is bullshit. The escape from the conventional living is paved by doing the opposite of what conventional wisdom preaches. Great results come from great imbalances. Four, environment is everything. Five, gatekeepers are dying. Don't ask for permissions. Six, build a brand likened to a personality. Seven, consistency builds brands. Eight, sell or be sold. Nine, shelve your biases. Look, business is hard enough. Don't make it any harder by letting your limited worldview corrupt the real world. Again, your perception is not the reality. Ten, to hell with SEO, search engine optimization. Free traffic and expanded margins complements of CEO are entirely different from free traffic and expanded margins complements of a productocracy. 11. Avoid fads or trends. 
Fad businesses might be poor ventures to pursue, but they can provide valuable business experience, especially for those who are just getting started. 12. Avoid politics in your business. Usually your business is politics. Never infect politics into your business as you risk alienating half your customers. 13. Not everyone likes coffee. Not everyone will like your product. Some will even waste their time attacking you. The fact is, anything you put your creative works out into the market mind, you are guaranteed to hear from haters, detractors, and people who don't like what you are doing. This is normal. The best you can do is assess, adjust, and act if their criticism is legit or ignore. Here are some selling strategies to get your productocracy moving. Tell a story. If you want to sell more of anything, give your product or company a story. People love stories because it's how we make sense of our world. Linking a story to a your company or product gives the customer a chance to become part of the narrative. When the story resonates with your customer's identity, it strengthens your brand. Who would you rather do business with? Tell your audience why you're in business. Be fiduciary about it. When they make the connection, they will choose you over the big bully on the block. Humanize your corporation. The fact is people want to do business with relatable people they like, not mammoth corporations hidden behind a bureaucratic wall. Appeal to self-interest, meaning and purpose. The ultimate consumer doctrine of selfishness is what's in it for me. The quicker and cleaner your customer learns what's in it for them, the quicker the sale. Forget features, doodads and sparkly accoutrements. Sell benefits. Prioritize social proof. The best sales secret isn't about sales at all. It's peer testimonials and reviews. It's the good word from your friends, family, and neighbors who have purchased in the past. In a digital sharing economy, social proof is the primary method in the buyer's decision process, not advertising. The four unscripted disciplines. Design, then ensure your future. The four disciplines. Once you've accomplished a scaling productocracy, the four disciplines finalize the difference between lifelong unscription and fleeting success. They are, number one, comparative immunity. Number two, purpose saving. Three, measured evaluation. And four, consequential thought. Comparative immunity. Well-dressed slaves are still slaves. Comparative immunity is being at peace with your present pace while abstaining from the unwinnable game of consumption. Comparison is future-orientated and focused on what is missing, creating anxiety. Gratitude is present-orientated and focused on what you have, creating peace. Purpose saving, prepping for lifetime passive income. The second unscripted discipline, purpose saving, is the one that gates the promised land, the end of forced servitude. Past due electrical bills, car payments, and price checking a box of Cheerios. The end of doing shit you hate for a paycheck you can't survive on. Your three objectives under the purpose saving discipline are number one, lifetime passive income. Growing your net worth is a job assigned to your business. The end game is the money system, which can be funded from two sources. Number one, purpose savings from business income, and two, a business sale, known as a liquidation event. Two, early retirement and dream pursuit. Three, tax relief. A total financial reconstruction consists of five retooling phases. They are, step number one, reframe. Reframing is changing your perception about money. First, rename money as value vouchers. Second, see one saved dollar as a tiny passive income machine that produces a nickel in lifetime passive income. Step two, reform. The second step is reforming expenses and cash outflow. This involves eliminating any expense that is not conductive to an unscripted objective. Step three, reduce. The third step of attacking is reducing debt, eventually paying back everything you owe. You must attack your debt and label it an enemy of the state. Step four, reallocate and remain. Financial reconstruction's fourth step is to reallocate something into your money system every month, even if it's only a few dollars. 
optimally allocate any surplus income after covering your business and living expenses. Step number five is reward. Reward is the final phase of financial reconstruction for purpose saving, giving yourself a gift for milestones achieved. Measured evaluation, reward and enjoy the ride. Measured evaluation is the discipline to raise your lifestyle disproportionately as your income rises. In essence, measured evaluation is a successful management of the reward phase in the purpose saving discipline. Consequential thought, protecting your kick-ass life. Consequential thought, the foresight into the consequences of our actions and knowing that our choices are unfairly weighted toward the bad ones. More money doesn't solve money problems. While a big income can postpone or hide consequences, eventually the consequences outlast the money. Chronic bad decision makers are left nowhere to hide. Your last business ever, if you want. An effective unscripted money system is allocated into two pots and an optimal third. The size of these pots is dependent on your lifestyle goals as well as your risk tolerance for each item they represent. The unscripted money system. The fuck you pot. The fuck you FU pot is ideal cash sitting in brokerages and money market accounts, usually doing nothing, and yes, making nothing. The point of the fuck you pot is not about yields or returns, but about options or choices. The home pot. The optimal home pot is your dream home, owned free and clear without a mortgage. While mortgage interest can be deducted on your tax returns, spending $1 to save 33 cents never makes sense. Whatever your tax bracket, your biggest lifetime expense will be your home. If you remove this expense, money will never be an issue. The other alternative and why the home pot is optimal is to have your next pot, the paycheck pot, large enough to pay your monthly mortgage, nut, or rent without a stress or issue. The paycheck pot. The paycheck pot is the lead horse while the others are auxiliary. For an unscripted entrepreneur, the paycheck pot is the end game, a passive income system of financial instruments that pay your bills, fund your lifestyle, and throw off regular cash you can count on. Such financial instruments can be bonds, ETFs, options, stocks, bank deposits, investment trust, anything that delivers a published, predictable yield. For our paycheck pot, there are six primary instruments we deploy to effectively rent our money. They are, number one, stock dividends, two, REIT dividends, three, MLP partnership incomes, four, bond interest, five, loan interest, and six, managed income. No matter if you're investing 10,000 or 10 million, there are seven rules I incorporate to ensure my principal is kept safe and the income flowing. Number one, the rent rule states that any time you cede control over your paycheck pot, money, demand rent, not unconditional promises, and coin flip pipe dreams. Number two, the SNAP rule requires that paycheck pot investments must remain highly liquid or recallable back to cash at the snap of a finger. Three, the apocalypse rule holds that only catastrophic threat to your principal investment has to come from a global financial apocalypse. Number four, the three years in three months rule. If any of your investments, whether they be stocks or bonds, appreciate unrealized gains greater than or equal to three years in dividends in any three month period, sell and take the profits. Number five, the annual Akbar rule. Dividends traps, alluring investments that ping your radar, not because of great balance sheets, but because the dividend yield is eye-popping, tempting. The Akbar rule is a classifier and identifier between an income investment and a speculative one. The rule is not disqualifying, although I avoid them, but quantitative. Such investments don't belong in the paycheck pot, but in the speculative fuck you pot. Number six, the 1% rule. When dealing with managed distributions from managed funds, avoid any fund with a management fee greater than 1%, excluding interest charges. And seven, the ostrich rule states that you should avoid investments where the business no longer jives with either the cultural or economic climate. Unscripted. My friend, this is the first day of the rest of your life. It is precious and it's yours. Don't give the script the deed to your life. Claw it back, rip it up, 
and rewrite your own unscripted story. And that's wrapping this book summary on Unscripted by MJ DeMarco. What do you think? If you want to hear from MJ DeMarco, I have interviewed him in the latest book summary podcast. So check it out now on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast. We at Best Book Bits are on our way to do 1,000 book summaries in video, written, and audio format. Check us out at bestbookbits.com. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And again, follow us on Spotify wherever you or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, if you want to download this PDF summary, click the link below to download that. And if you want to sponsor Best Book Bits, you can by educating yourself further with our premium products and services. So head over now to bestbookbits.com forward slash products where you can get consulting, coaching, eBooks, books, courses, and all the good stuff there. Again, thank you for watching and listening to this long summary. Go out there and live the unscripted life. Take care. Bye-bye now.